Good morning and welcome to Laurelwood. So glad that you're here. Uh, normally I would welcome those online. We're having a little bit of problem with our live stream this morning. So apologies for uh, starting a little bit later and uh, no one's watching online right now, but once we get online, um, <laughs> hopefully you will be able to join us. So we wanted this morning, uh, we want to just worship uh, for, for those of us who are here in this room, we're going to get a chance to be able to sing. And again, hopefully we'll get our live stream working here in just a, a moment or so. But we want to give our joy and we want to give our worship to God. Would you stand with me this morning as we open up in a word of prayer? Lord, thank you for this chance that we have uh, this morning on this day to give you glory, to give you praise. Um, and Lord, despite technical difficulties and despite technology and internet stuff that isn't quite working, Lord, we recognize that you are in control, God, that you are good, and so we give you joy, and we give you worship this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, we're going to start off with that new song that we've been uh, doing, the joy in the house of the Lord. We won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. Let's do this. You go. Shout out your 
Praise God. You may be seated. Josh, come on up. Josh is one of our elders. He's going to share with us some of the announcements and things going on this morning. Morning, Laurelwood. Yeah, so uh, like Kevin said, my name is Josh. I'm one of the elders here at Laurelwood. Um, and uh, just want to make uh, some announcements this, this morning. Uh, so first off, as we all know, communication card. We know the drill. If you're a member, regular attender, just jot your name down so that we know that you are here. Um, but if you are new, put down all your information so that uh, we can be in contact with you and you can learn more about uh, what we do here at Laurelwood. Um, and also, uh, as the elders, we love to pray for you guys. And so every Tuesday, uh, we pray for you um, from the request that you put here on the communication card. Um, so there's an area for non-confidential prayer requests where uh, everyone at the church can be praying for you. Um, but if it's something a little more personal that you just want uh, the elders to know about, put it in the confidential and then uh, we can make sure that the elders are, are praying for those, for those requests. Oh, and be sure to uh, drop them in the basket in the back after the service. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, after the service is over, we have something called the fireside. Uh, so meet the elders at the fireside. So I'll be back there after the service. Uh, if you want to talk uh, to me and or another elder, uh, uh, just to learn more about our church, or if you need some prayer, um, head over to the fireplace just to the left as you walk out here after the service. And then a uh, search team update. Um, so just uh, just for the sake of repetition, we've probably you guys have probably heard this for the past few weeks now. But uh, a few weeks ago, we talked we we mentioned that we had uh, a candidate in mind, and then they kind of pulled out of the race. And so uh, we the the search team has been uh, looking for new candidates, and uh, they've been getting new applications in, uh, and they're pretty excited about it, which is really cool. And just to reiterate. This doesn't mean we're starting from scratch. Uh, the search team, the, the first like four or five months of uh, what they did uh, for looking for Pastor Next is already done. It doesn't mean that we're starting back from when we first started this whole search process. Um, so uh, now we're just looking for that next person to uh, candidate here at Laurelwood. And so we're kind of excited about um, who that person might be. Um, and then... Uh, and then, yeah, and so they're, yeah, reviewing resumes, watching sermons, and making initial contact with, with some of the new applicants. So it's pretty exciting. Uh, and now we are going to hear from Krista Hagen about what God has been teaching her lately. So let's watch the video. Hey, Laurelwood family. I am so excited to get to share something with you today. I, uh, begged Kevin to please let me be the next testimony because I am just bursting to share the joy and wonder of how God is working in our life as a family. So thank you, Kevin, for giving me this opportunity. Now, church family, I have a question for you. What do a Honda Odyssey and a roll of toilet paper have to do with the gospel? Well, I will tell you. A long time ago, a very important mentor of mine introduced me to some verses in 1 John, and I want to read those to you now. It's 1 John 3, 16 through 18. We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoever has the world's goods and sees his brother in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? Little children, let us not love with word or tongue, but in deed and in truth. Laurelwood family, you helped share the gospel with a single mom and her son this last weekend. I put out a plea on Facebook a couple weeks ago saying, hey, Dave and I are helping a friend of mine settle. She's moving from Woodland, California to Salem, Oregon, and she has almost nothing for her house to get her started. Please will you help us so that she has all the little things she needs to get started in Salem. And oh my gosh, did you say yes. 16 different families helped to fill out the list I provided. Everything from can openers to pots and pans to Ziploc bags and toilet paper. It was astounding the way that you provided. Um, a wonderful couple from our church provided their home for the weekend for my three crazy wonderful kids so that David and I could make a lightning fast trip down to Woodland and back. 
We are so thankful for how you've participated, and we have so much to share about this. In the car on the way from Woodland to Salem, my friend and I got to talk, and she had so many questions about the gospel and the Bible, and it was awesome to have that time with her. In the other car, David had a chance to talk with her son, this 12-year-old who's had such a hard time in life, and here's David ministering to him and having great, encouraging conversations with him before he gets settled in a new middle school in Salem. And to top it all off, we ended our trip at their new home in Salem, where my friend walked in and saw this huge pile of the things that our Laurelwood family had provided for her. And she said, I cannot believe these people. She goes, Krista, I mean, I can believe you would do this, but who are these people? And I said, my dear friend, these are my people. They love Jesus and they love you because Jesus loves you. And she was overwhelmed and Daniel was overwhelmed, her son. And it was just such a fantastic moment of the gospel. These verses from first John and so many other verses in the new Testament coming to life right there for my friend and her son. Thank you, Laurelwood family, for participating in the gospel with us. Please pray for my friend and her son as they get established in their new home and a new life. And thank you, thank you, thank you for participating with us and continuing to give. We love our Laurelwood family. Well, thank you, Krista Hagen, for sharing that. Um, exciting to, to hear and to know that our Laurelwood family was helping share the gospel. We're going to continue worshiping right now. And, uh, you know, on Tuesdays, our worship team, we get together and um, we, we plan our, uh, the music and the service. We plan all that on Tuesday during our practice time. We, we gather in that back room there and we pray and we read scripture. And then we talk about what songs are resonating. And the song we're going to do next that Cindy's going to lead, uh, this is a song that we just, as a worship team, felt really compelled uh, to do this morning. And as Cindy was practicing the song on Tuesday, as we were practicing it, um, uh, we kind of had a special moment um, with this song, King of My Heart. There's a, the, the chorus that says, you are good, you are good, you are good. Uh, but yeah, what, what if uh, our circumstances aren't always good? And Cindy kind of shared some stuff, and, and uh, I'm going to let her share a little bit of uh, what, what she shared with us and what's going on with this song uh, to hopefully encourage us this morning as we worship. Um, I want to tag on to Krista because that's such a wonderful praise, and I think as a community we have um, the responsibility to share each other's joys, but we also have the responsibility to share each other's sorrows and I'm gonna tell you guys that I need you guys I need you guys to stand alongside me some of you know my story and some of you don't the full extent but I'll just tell you that um we unexpectedly got pregnant and against all odds there's so many things why this was never supposed to happen and um, I lost it at eight weeks unexpectedly and it didn't feel good it really didn't feel good, and that's why I struggled with this song, is I keep coming to church, and I've had a hard time singing, and I just keep saying, God, this doesn't feel good. I can't sing that you're good, and Kevin, this is why I need you guys. Kevin came alongside. He said, Cindy, God is good, and it finally hit me that my water is all muddy, okay? God is, has nothing to do with this sad. He's not a part of He doesn't create sadness and horrible things. I, he creates joy and goodness, and he's still good, and he has a plan for my life, even though God doesn't say he's not going to let bad things happen. He says, I will use those good things, those bad things to make good things happen, to make good in your life. I think about Jesus on the cross. You know, he died. He died on a Friday, a horrible death. There's nothing good about it. I can't even go, you know, celebrate Easter Day and think about Friday and think this, there's anything good about his death. That he died and he had to go through all this suffering. But, and then Saturday, no one knew what was happening, right? Everyone's like, okay, he says, this is what has to happen and something better is going to happen. But what is it? He died. And then Sunday is the victory. And so I feel like so many of us go through something that's painful and hard and we're experiencing a Friday where it's just, this is too hard, it's too much. And then we go into a Saturday where we're waiting. We're waiting for Sunday for, for God to reveal himself. So I just, I just ask that you guys would sing with me today and, and declare in your hearts that God is good. The circumstances may not be good, things that are hard may not be go doing good, but he can use them just like he can use vinegar and all sorts of, you know, vanilla stuff and cakes that don't taste good. 
He puts them in there, puts them through the fire, and they make this beautiful cake. And we all know that without those certain ingredients, it's not going to be a good cake. So he just says, hang on, accept this, take it, let it be a part of you, and I'm going to grow you, and I'm going to turn you into something beautiful. So I just ask that you would stand with me today, and even though things may hurt and things may um, feel like they're not good, I can just declare that God you are good and you have a good plan for my life and the enemy is under my feet where he belongs.
Jesus Christ, my living hope. 
for this morning to remember, to reflect. <laughs> God, you're our living hope. You are good. God, you are the author of good things. And even when circumstances and situations are not good, Lord, we declare, and God, we stand in faith. We stand together as this church, and we say you are good. God, that you are good. Our living hope, Jesus, thank you you are good. And we give you all praise and we give you all glory this morning. Amen. I want to take this moment right now to dismiss our youth group students. Anyone that's in middle school or high school, this is uh, once a month. Once a month we have a special time for our high school and middle school students to go together. So follow Sam back there and Sam's going to have a special teaching time for all of you. And for the rest of us here, we get the privilege of Pastor Dennis Bailey. Ed McMahon, thank you. <laughs> We're so glad you're here this morning. It's our custom to give away a high-end Bible each week from all the communication cards that were signed last week. The secretary Turks takes out one at random. And this random card from last week, Renee Farnsworth. I haven't seen Renee. Oh, here you are, Renee. And be sure to pray for Renee's husband, Rick, who's having some heart problems. So, oh, kidney problems. Okay. Pray for Rick Farnsworth as he deals with some health issues. And we welcome those of you watching online, hopefully. <laughs> we don't know yet. And, you know, we live in a time of polarization. Uh, Democrat, Republican. Climate change, no climate change. Vax, no vax. Masks, no masks. I mean, we're just all over the place. In such a complex culture, it'd be important to determine how do you find God's will. And it was a complex culture in the first century as well, as you had Roman Gentile soldiers occupying Orthodox Jewish Israel. And of course, the change had come as uh, as many as 5% of the Orthodox Jews became Christians in the first century. That's a 5% at least. And they had to get along. They had to find God's will together. In Acts chapter 11, we discover how Peter found God's will. And apparently Israel had missed out on God's will for the most part from uh, Abrahamic covenant, which was 2,000 years prior, 
where God told Israel through, through the seed of Messiah, Israel would be a light to all nations. Unfortunately, by the first century, Israel had turned inward and they were only trying to be a light to each other in light of the Jewish Messiah for the Jewish people who are kosher, circumcised, Sabbath worshipers, etc., etc. Well, in Acts chapter 10, Peter has a vision where God tells him to eat unkosher food. And at that very moment, some unkosher Gentiles showed up and told him that there was an unkosher, unkosher centurion who needed to hear the gospel. Now that's what Acts chapter 10 is about. And then we turn to Acts chapter 11, and it's the same story told in a little different way. What's going on? Well, Luke, who wrote the Acts, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, was told that telling that story, that the good news about the Jesus Jewish Messiah was not for Orthodox Jews only, but also for Gentiles. So how do you know it's time for a big change. Now, we're not talking about micro change here. We're talking about macro change. Uh, a parallel in our time would be if, if uh, Laura Wood were to drop baptism from membership, for membership. You didn't have to be baptized to be a member. Or we change the communion juice to communion wine. Or we allowed polygamous couples uh, who came from countries where polygamy was legal. By the way, polygamy is legal in over 50 countries. And of course, there's immigrants from those countries all the time. Now, none of those are in the offing. <laughs> but it's that kind of change that Peter faced when he's told to go to a Roman soldier Gentile. And I'm sure in Peter's mind, it was like unthinkable. And I'm sure that you have in your own mind people that are unreachable, like maybe David Berkowitz, son of Sam, who had the talking dog, who was a serial killer. Guess what? David Berkowitz has become a Christian in jail. And you immediately say to yourself, well, you know, jailhouse conversion, so we can get out on parole early, right? He has refused his parole hearings because he says that God has called him to a ministry of lifers in prison. David Berkowitz, an absolutely unlikely prospect for the gospel. A more contemporary person would be um, Brian Head Welsh. Now, probably most of you here do not know who Brian Head Welsh is, but he's a player in a heavy metal rock band called Korn, lead guitarist. And he's become a Christian, outspoken clear. So who we consider unreachable, David Berkowitz or uh, uh, Brian Head Welsh, they indeed are not beyond the gospel. In order to determine what we ought to do in difficult sociological situations, we have to choose the basis of our change. The basis of our change could be reason. I'm talking about pure reason, pure logic, pure science, not scientism and reasonable. I'm talking about irdisputable, indisputable. H2O is water on earth, and H2O will be water in heaven. Uh, two plus three is five on earth, and two plus three will be five in heaven. There are certain things that are absolutely true. But Albert Einstein said only about 2% of knowledge is of that absolute nature. And Al Albert Einstein was smarter than the average bear, and he said it's only 2%. But reason, pure truth, all truth is God's truth, is one way to make a decision. Now, the next two ways are more dangerous, experience and tradition. Experience is how we feel about it. Do you like chocolate or vanilla ice cream? Do you want to wear a blue outfit or a red outfit? These are emotional, experiential decisions. And there are no absolutes in those areas. That's why they're dangerous. Another one would be tradition. Now, tradition can be neutral. I mean, we celebrate independence on July 4th when technically July 2nd was the day of independence. Uh, we shoot off fireworks on July 4th. That's it. It's our tradition. And there, it's probably a new tradition, maybe a fun tradition. And so there are things that are traditional that uh, don't matter. 
and yet uh, things that are traditional can cause great disharmony. For example, uh, uh, do we celebrate Mother's Day or shall we celebrate Mother-in-Law's Day? <laughs> Try to make that change. Good luck with that. And so things that are one way can be another. Now, so we can use reason, science, pure logic, or we can use experience, or we can use tradition, and experience and tradition are very dangerous. If it's science, all truth is God's truth. But of course, the best way to make decisions is using the Bible, God's inerrant, infallible truth. And as we look at uh, Peter's decision, as he recounts it in Acts chapter 11, I believe we find a biblical pattern that shows us how to make change. So I would like to give a couple of prerequisites. First of all, you need to be in good physical health, good mental health. I used to tell the church board, let's not make any decisions after 10 p.m. at night because we're all tired. We won't make a good decision. But many people, unfortunately, approach the Bible with what I call the Bible magic method. The Bible, message, the Bible magic method is like this. I open my Bible at random and I go, Judas went out and hanged himself. Well, I don't want like that one. I'll try another one. Go thou and do likewise. <laughs> well, that's not good. Let's choose something else. Whatever you do, do quickly. That is the magic Bible approach to finding God's will, and it is flawed. You have to find God's will or you may stand in God's way. Wouldn't that be a terrible thing to find out on Judgment Day that by not seeking God's will, you ended up hindering God's way? But the more you seek God's will, you'll see that some of these things that seem important are, are less important. As a matter of fact, I have found that most people who are preoccupied with evangelism, discipleship, tend not to get involved in these sociological side issues because that's not what they're all about. What they're all about is seeing people find Christ and following up those people who find Christ, uh, depend, not depending upon whether they dance or not. Here, uh, Peter's praying on the rooftop, and these Gentiles come. He goes to Cornelius' house. Gentiles become Christians. But then in Acts chapter 11, verses 1 to 3, occur. Now, you have to ask yourself, is the, are these three verses verses of surprise or verses of judgment? Acts 11 verses 1 to 3, the Gentile apostles heard, excuse me, the Jewish apostles heard the Gentiles had received the word of God. And when Peter came to Jerusalem, those who were circumcised took issue with him saying, you went to uncircumcised men and you ate with them a double no-no. Eating with Gentiles and they were uh, uncircumcised Gentiles, a double no-no. And there was this group in Jerusalem who the Apostle Paul would later call the party of the circumcision who believed that those who received the Jewish Messiah must first become Jewish, and then they can receive the Jewish Messiah. And, and later, Peter in Acts 15, verse 19, will say, it's my judgment that we not trouble the Gentiles who are turning to God. And trouble them with what? Trouble them with the ceremonial commandments of the New Testament. So how do you know it's a time for a change? First principle, Peter says in verse 1 of Acts chapter 11, I was praying. This is the principle of it's easier to move a moving object than a stationary object. And if you're praying, you're already moving towards the will of God. And so prayer is the first step in determining God's will in this situation. The second point here that he makes very clear in the outline, too, but a voice from heaven. Are you ready for a change of attitude? A voice from heaven answered a second time, what God has cleansed no longer, uh, no longer consider unholy. Now, you may be saying, if I heard a voice from heaven, <laughs> I, would, I would also pay attention like getting a bucket of water thrown in my face. But remember, Peter here 
In Acts chapter 11 and 10, uh, he does not have the benefit of the 27 books of the New Testament. He doesn't have them. And at this point, the Apostle Paul is not a leader in the church, so he doesn't even have the counsel of the Apostle Paul. So for us, we are in a better advantage. We are in a better situation than the Apostle Peter because we have the 27 books of the New Testament to counsel us much better than a simple vision, even though a vision is quite spectacular. There's two conversions here. The conversion of the Gentile soldier Cornelius, who turns from idol worship to Christ. And there's the conversion of Peter, who turns from ceremonial law to the grace, full grace of Jesus Christ. It's not wrong to have preferences. I went to a missionary trip uh, to Costa Rica, San Juan, outside in the suburbs. We're building a church. And let me tell you, all I could do is manual labor because I'm not, I'm not skilled when it comes to the construction arts. Well, anyway, uh, we worked there for about 10 days. And the church there in Costa Rica that we were building for, they had a feast for us at the end of that 10 days, often called a fiesta. And uh, one of the, we had two churches involved, my church in Ukiah and First Baptist Stockton, two churches. Well, Julie Riddle was from the First Baptist Church of Stockton. And we showed up to this fiesta, this banquet, and almost every dish has meat in it, and she's a vegetarian. And she said to herself, I have to make up my mind. Meat has not touched my lips for over 10 years, and yet... I need to think about the importance of the gospel, not the importance of my diet. And for the first time in 10 years, Julie Riddle had meat. So she could have a ministry with the people there in Costa Rica. We have to be ready for change if we're going to be part of God's strategy to reach this generation for Christ. And we have to be careful that we don't resort to what I call compensating mechanisms. You know, Peter's praying here. Now, let's reconstruct Peter praying on the rooftop. He's praying and the Lord comes and says, Here, Peter, eat these unkosher foods, horse neck and dog leg and bugs and all these things that Peter would not eat. And you might not either. <laughs> but, but anyway, uh, Peter says, uh, uh, Lord, I, I, I can't deal with this vision right now. I'm praying. This is called religious compensation. I find it very often true among big givers. Not all big givers. Some big givers are just as spiritual as the little givers. But some big givers, because they give tens of thousands of dollars to the cause of Christ, feel justified not being involved in evangelism and discipleship. I'm, I'm so involved in my business where I'm making hundreds of thousands of dollars, which allows me to give tens of thousands of dollars to the church and missions, I don't have time for evangelism discipleship. And Peter, in his praying, could have said, you know, Lord, I don't have time for a vision. I've got to get my prayer life squared away. And, and sometimes we do that. We use overcompensation in another spiritual area to excuse noncompliance in another spiritual area. If you're uncertain about God's will, ask a mature brother and sister in Christ what it might be. So the first thing here, he seeks God's will in prayer. The second thing, he gets clarity. This vision is from God. And then thirdly here in verse 11, he's alert to providence. At that moment, he's seen this unkosher vision. At that moment, three Gentile men appeared before the house in which we were staying, having been sent to me from Caesarea. Now, coincidence in this case, and in many cases in the Bible, is a miracle where God decides to remain invisible. See, Peter sees this unkosher blanket, three unkosher men at the door. It's coincidence. No, it's a miracle, but God has chosen in this situation to remain anonymous. And very often when there is direction from God about a change, it's for the purpose 
of are you open to new outreach? This is verses 12, 13, and 14. Are you open to new outreach? The Spirit told me to go with them without misgivings. And it's that word misgivings. Without, it means without respecting faces. So don't worry about what they look like is the idea behind misgivings. These six brethren also went with me, Jewish brethren. We entered Cornelius' house. He reported to us how he had seen the angel standing in his house saying, Send to Joppa, have Peter brought here. He shall speak words by which you will be saved. Now, if God could send an angel uh, to, uh, to uh, Cornelius... Why couldn't the angel witness to Cornelius? I mean, wouldn't that be pretty spectacular? An angel appears before you and says, I got four principles. God loves you. You're a sinner. Christ died for sins. You need to make a commitment to Christ and follow him. I mean, couldn't the angel have done that? Of course the angel could have done that. But you know what? You and I have the privilege of telling people about Jesus Christ. God has given us a privilege that the angels do not even have. And do we take advantage of it? No, we spoil or shun the opportunities that God gives us. There's a barrier here. It's racial, it's cultural, it's religious between Peter and Cornelius. But the Spirit told Peter to go. Coincidence is dangerous. Francis Schaeffer, as a young man, had a father who wanted him to go to college to be an engineer. Francis Schaeffer felt the call of God upon his heart to be a pastor. And we thank God that he was a pastor given his contribution in the last half of the last century uh, through his books and lectures and the brief fellowship there in Europe. Francis Schaeffer has had an unequivocal impact for Jesus Christ. And yet his father wanted him to be an engineer. And so the day he was supposed to go to college, he took out a coin. Heads, I go to seminary. Tails, I get an engineering degree. First time heads. Well, I better do it again. Heads, I go to seminary. Tails, I go to secular school. Heads a second time. He says, well, I better do it again. Third time, he flips the coin. It comes up heads three times in a row. He went to seminary instead of going to a secular university to become an engineer. Coincidence? Miracle? Well, Francis Schaeffer, in the book The Tapestry, says no one should ever make a decision about God's will by flipping a coin. He speaks against it. He would say, I believe, as Peter found here, the principles for finding God's will are found in the Scripture, praying looking for a clear understanding, being ready for a change of attitude, being alert to providence, and being uh, open to new outreach. These are the principles that God uses to point us in the right direction. And I'm not saying this is easy, but I am saying the more you seek God's will, the less you'll be tripped up by tradition and culture and these things that tend to bother us where the scripture ultimately is silent. <laughs> I talked about, uh, you know, how it'd be a great controversy if, if uh, we were to drop baptism as a requirement for membership, there'd be controversy in the church. I have no doubt about that. <laughs> but I remember controversy about baptisms in my ministry. Uh, one time we had a new person come into the church and they had been baptized in a Pentecostal church and they baptize in the name of Jesus only. Do we accept that best baptism? I remember also we had a new member who had been baptized in the Mennonite Brethren Church, and they dunked three times in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit. And I said, let's just accept the first dunk. We get all hung up on these nuances rather than asking the question, what will advance the cause of Christ? Not what do I like, not what do you like. The more you seek God's will, the less you'll be hung up on the sociological issues. Life is hard. Change is hard. 
uh, the unexamined life is not worth living, but the examined life uh, is no picnic either. So here is the pursuit of truth, but the truth is we are to welcome one another and not dispute over cultural differences. We are to receive, accept one another, and not dispute over cultural differences. That's what 1 Corinthians 8 and Romans 14 is all about. But Peter did not have the advantage of having Paul's letters to Romans and Corinthians. You must find God's will in God's way, and there has to be, there has to be a change in us if we're going to have the greatest ministry possible for Jesus Christ. Wouldn't you hate to get to heaven someday and find out because you had a sociological, cultural prejudice that you were not able to lead as many people to Christ as you could have, and you were not able to disciple as many people for Christ as you could have? And I said, as I prayed about this sermon this week, I said, oh, Lord, not let, do not let that be true of me. The next key to God's will are you thinking in spiritual terms. This is verses uh, 16 and 17. And Peter says, I remembered the word of the Lord, how Christ used to say, G John baptized with water, but you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If God gave to them, the Gentiles, the same gift he gave to us after believing in Christ at Pentecost, who was I that I could stand in God's way. Peter needs an attitude change, and he starts to get his thinking centered on spiritual terms when he remembers what Christ said. Water baptism, spiritual baptism, and of course, uh, Christ's words are the word of God. And then finally here, are you looking for biblical results? This is verse 18. And when they, the Jewish leaders, heard this, that the Gentiles in Cornelius' household and, and Cornelius himself, when they heard this, that the Spirit had come upon them and they were baptized with the Holy Spirit, they, the Jewish Orthodox leaders, quieted down and glorified God, saying, God has granted to the Gentiles the repentance that leads to life. So how do you know it's time for change? It's right there in your bulletin. I believe the things that God used in Peter's life, he was praying, he saw a vision, which for us is the word of God, a voice from heaven a second time. Sometimes we need a reminder. Are you alert to providence? Not that providence is an end all because uh, the fleece is a dangerous way to live, as Francis Schaeffer points out. Are you open to new outreach? This question, are you open to new outreach, is a question that... Uh, Many Christians and many churches answer incorrectly. Are you looking for biblical parallels? Uh, this, uh, the analogy of Scripture is one of the great interpretation tools. Uh, the Spirit fell on them at Pentecost. The Spirit fell on P Cornelius and his household. And then are you thinking in spiritual terms? I remembered the Word of God. And are you observing biblical results? They... Uh, God has granted repentance to the Gentiles, the repentance that leads to life. God's will is not lost. God's will is clear, but we have to make sure that we're seeking God's will and not our own will. Seeking God's agenda and not our own agenda. And so uh, maybe you could keep this little outline the next time uh, God's got a controversy facing you, and ask whether or not these elements are present in your life as you seek God's will. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, uh, we are so ego-centered, and we want our will first, and yet we know that your word has given us principles to live by that we might find your will in difficult circumstances. Help us, Father, to dethrone that ego and allow the Spirit to lead us in light of the Word of God that we might accomplish what you want to be done at Laurelwood, particularly in the areas of evangelism and discipleship. 
Help us, Father, to seek your will, that we might not uh, stand in your way about what you want to accomplish in this church in the next generation. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Dennis. Let's stand this morning as we close with this classic chorus, Jesus' name above all names. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Just a reminder as you leave today, place your communication cards in the basket back there. And uh, by putting your communication card, you will be eligible for a Pastor Dennis Bible next Sunday. Have a great Sunday. God bless.